thank you very much for joining us for this morning's debate. This House believes we more, need more immigration. A few words on housekeeping. Each uh, team has nominated someone to go first and someone to go second. The speakers going first will have ten minutes uh, to speak. The speakers going second in rebuttal will have five uh, minutes each. I'll then open out to questions from the floor. I'll take questions in pairs and each side can answer the, uh, each question, each nominating the speaker to answer one question and one question on the other uh, side. Um, finally, uh, we have a timekeeper today, the Debbie McGee to my Paul Daniels, if you will. Uh, Simon is sitting uh, with, uh, behind the camera. He's going to hold up his red card precipitately at two minutes to go when you've got two minutes left, and then again at one minute to go, and then Simon's arm will be raised imperiously trapped when you have zero mark, which will be the cue to commence brutal heckling from the audience. So you after we've conducted the debate, we will have a vote. There are too many of you to count with any great speed, so we'll take a vote by acclamation afterwards, which is to say those who are in favour of the motion will shout aye, those who are against the motion will shout nay. You'll of course say what you thought beforehand without taking into account anything you've uh, listened to, as is always the way any kind of free debate or debate. But I do urge you nevertheless to pay uh, close attention to this expert panel, and I invite you please to welcome me in joining the speakers. First of all, in proposition, Tim Evans from the Econom Economic Policy Centre, I'm uh, speaking with Andrew Sylvester from the Institute of Directors. <laughs> and in opposition, if not from, then certainly in the European Parliament, Roger Helmer <laughs> and Ted Roman from Heritage. <laughs> and with no further ado, I invite Dr Tim Evans to propose the motion, This House Believes That We Need More Immigration. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Chairman. And, um, we actually, I confess to you, we have an agreement, we have a consensus, um, led by Roger, we've all agreed we're going to remain seated. With one caveat, if you cannot hear us, please let us know, because at that point, Roger and I and the other team, are going, we're all going to stand up and, and then forth. So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Jolly good, yeah. okay. So, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really honoured to have been invited to this debate and to propose this motion uh, uh, with the Freedom Association. Because when I used to be, when I was 12, 13, I used to be put to bed as early as children of, of that generation were. And what did I do? I used to sit with my torch <laughs> under the big poster, reading Freedom Today, which used to be the newspaper of the Freedom Association. <laughs> for me, for me um, what I've loved about the Freedom Association is the organisation's pa passion for freedom and liberty for economic growth and prosperity, for choice and diversity, and all the things that make a, a free market and an open society. What I've also loved about the Freedom Association, being consistently on the free market side, is your hatred of protectionism. Politicians, statism, government, racism, whatever the left have ever said, they're wrong about you, you know? You're not little Englanders. You have a global outlook and you think of Britain as global Britain. In fact, for you, the EU is just another little pathetic nation state with its own <laughs> little flag and its army and its little German army. And in your economic thinking, what you've always tried to engage is the international free migration of capital, trade, property, and labor. That's the reality. And that's why I am proposing this motion that this House does believe that we are going to need more immigration in the future. Because it's not just about people coming here. It's not just about our prosperity, our growth, our enterprise, our businesses in the future. It's also about British people engaging the world, going to live abroad, going to work in China, projecting our success. In the 21st century, I like the Freedom Association. I know you're going to do well, because like me, you believe in more. More is one of your favorite words. You want more and better health care, more and better clothes, more and better holidays, more and better jobs. You want more and better freedom, more and better schools, 
more and better restaurants, food. You are, in one word, the association for more. And you know that to get more, we're going to have to build more airports. China's building every couple of years more, more airports than we've built in the last century. And no doubt, I mean, the Heathrow debate you know, about another runway, it started before I was born. <laughs> I'm 50 next year. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? We're going to need more. Yeah? No, it's going to... I'm a libertarian, and I have a passion for more. And I, I can smell political elitism and states a mile away. When the Berlin Wall came down, I was the chief advisor to the Slovak Prime Minister. So I have lived with the consequences of communism, and I've tried to open markets up and reform. Here's a bit of socialism for you. This, like the euro, the dollar, all these other unbacked, feared, funny monies. This has lost 98% of its value since the Second World War. This is another bit of socialism, whether it's an EU passport, a British passport, whatever. This would have appalled people in Britain in the Georgian period, in the Victorian period. This is a passport not to freedom, but to bureaucracy, state welfare. Yeah? That wretched Soviet mass-murdering National Health Service that the Labour Party gave us in 1945 when they took into public ownership 3,118 hospitals, homes and clinics. Yeah? What I want is more. I want more global engagement. I want to be able to go work abroad, live abroad, fall in love, marry. I'm very happily married. This is not coming as used to my wife. I am making a point here. But we also know that when politicians say, trust us, we're going to build your motor cars. Remember British Labour? Remember the Morris Marina? Yeah? When politicians say, no, we'll run your telephone system, yeah. You'll be lucky to get a Bakelite phone in four colours and you'll wait three months for the privilege. When the Prime Minister says he's going to set targets for immigration to manage passport socialism, expect the targets to be missed. Yeah? Expect them to be missed. The problem is not with the Prime Minister. The problem is with the infrastructural architecture that underpins the system. In the future, I want more private money. I don't want money to come from central banks. They're Soviet institutions. In the future, I don't want to be told that because I've got this, that I can't marry someone from India or to go and work in China. I want more. If you vote against this motion, if you are not realistic about the century ahead, you will be letting the Freedom Association down. It will be a blow for free markets, for British business, and all the things that this association has fought so hard for over the decades. That's a hard choice and a reality. Now, I know there are some people who'd like to caricature this debate in terms of it being somehow lazy, welfareist Muslims come here to steal our jobs. Though this debate is way more important than that. Yeah? This is about our right to move around, not as the holders of socialism and funny money, but as free people on this earth. So the choice for you is, are you on the side of freedom and global Britain? Or are you going to retrench to exactly where the far left and the Labour Party would love you to be? They'd love to caricature you as corporatists, close-minded, bigoted little Englanders. The Freedom Association has never been that. And I hope you will not be that today. Don't play into the hands of the left. Be realistic. Recognise the 21st century is going to be about more. You're in a country 
where less than 2% of the land mass has been civilized. Less than 2% of the land has been built on. Yeah? Less than 2% if you take the UK. If you take roads, villages, schools, cities. Go up in an aeroplane, look down. It's 98% green. We're not full up. London, Birmingham, Manchester, they're still relatively low-lying cities. Yeah? Yes. Relatively low-lying. Yeah? Look at what is being built in Asia, in China. Yeah? Go for freedom and go for growth. I know that shocks you, but don't duck the choice. The choice is for growth, for prosperity, or it is against immigration, it is for more closure and disengagement. It's a tough choice, but I am absolutely certain that Britain and you have to go with globalisation. Yeah? Thank you. I thank Tim for his speech and call on Roger Evans to reply in opposition. Roger Helmut, excuse Helmut. me. <laughs> excuse me, it would be really terrible. Roger Helmut uh, speaking. I'm having a crisis of identity here, ladies and gentlemen. And can I, can I start by reassuring him that on this side of the desk we are equally in favour of freedom and growth and global engagement. Uh, it's just that the vision that Tim has presented sounds to me uh, a bit more like anarchy and a bit less like liberty. You cannot have liberty unless you have some sort of order in the country and a sort of let them all come uh, policy would undermine social order completely. And can I reassure Tim? He wants to be able to work abroad. I have worked in America, I've worked across Europe, I've worked in Southeast Asia, East Asia, I've been resident in those countries. I haven't found the lack of global free movement remotely a problem. Now, I should have started out by welcoming everybody who is here and thanking you all for coming, and it's good to see you. I trust you all had a great night yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. If any of you, if any of you overindulged a little bit and are perhaps feeling just a little bit of the effect, um, I've got a recommendation for you. I would suggest you take a couple of aspirins. <laughs> but I want to stress a point here just because two aspirins are good for you, that does not mean that a hundred aspirins are better. <laughs> our position, and forgive me, but I can't help speaking from my party's point of view, our position on immigration is we recognize the need for immigration. We know that Britain is a country of immigrants. If you go back far enough, I think my ancestors came from Holland and we continue to need immigration, and I reassure the Institute of Directors, is it the CBI Institute of Directors, on that point. We are absolutely in support of immigration, but we do not quite have Tim's vision of a green and pleasant land with tiny bits of development. That is not my experience of this country. That is not the experience of people who are on social housing waiting lists or are looking at house prices going through the roof uh, in London. We are in the most, in England at least, we are in the most crowded major country in Europe. We are more crowded than India or China or Japan. Um, and that I think is a key point to bear in mind. So let's do the myth destruction bit. Myth number one, we're against immigration. No, we're not. And by the way, let me stress, this debate is not we want to stop immigration. This debate, the motion says, we need more immigration. We've gone through a phase when the Labour government let rip they say, of, uh, they say of Tony Blair that he hated the British working class, so he decided to import a new one of his own. Yeah, that's what he did. <laughs> Immigration over the last 15 years has been at unprecedented levels, and we cannot sustain it, uh, and we will not sustain it. Things that are unsustainable will not be sustained. Um, let me bust the second myth. The Guardian would love you to believe that those who are opposed to immigration, including my party, are racists. We hate colored people, we hate ethnic minorities, we hate foreigners. No, we do not. We are outward looking people. We in my party want an immigration policy that is based on numbers, to be agreed with the uh, Institute of Directors and the CBI, but based on numbers and based on skills. Let me be absolutely clear. I would rather see a qualified Indian software engineer coming to Britain than an unskilled Romanian. 
That is the difference. And I, I will not fall into the error and cliche of saying some of my best friends come from ethnic minorities, but during my 15 years in the European Parliament, I have had a large number of assistants in my office, including a significant number who have been from ethnic minorities. I remember a wonderful Nigerian chap, very urbane, well-educated and courteous, called Isaiah, uh, and I have an ethnic member of an ethnic minority in my office at the moment. We are not against foreigners. Indeed, the other person in my office is an Italian, so foreigners, <laughs> foreigners, foreigners as well. Um, we are not against foreigners. We do not want to build a wall around the country. We do not want to blow up the Channel Tunnel. Uh, we want immigrants, and we want numbers and skills to be the, cri uh, the criteria. Now, if you go back to the, uh, uh, if you go back to the um, uh, history of this debate, we were not allowed previously to talk about immigration because that made you racist. And one of the contributions with both, both the Freedom Association and, if I may say so, my party, have made to public discourse in this country, we have brought the issue to the foreground and made it respectable, and I can tell you on the doorstep, it is of critical importance. In those days, we saw report after report produced by left-wing think tanks saying there were economic benefits uh, of, uh, uh, economic benefits of, of mass immigration. In the EU, they like to talk about four freedoms, free movement of capital, goods, labor, uh, and something else that I've forgotten. Um, we, we, we've just heard from Tim that these are linked together. These are the freedoms. They are not the freedoms. We believe in free trade. But free trade doesn't require free movement of people. Indeed, it's the reverse. If you can trade freely, if you can move capital freely, you can open factories where labor is cheap. You don't have to bring the cheap labor back home. And can I quote Milton Friedman? You're going to love this. Milton Friedman <laughs> said very clearly, yeah. you can have a welfare system yeah. or you can have free movement of people. Yeah. You cannot have both. Yeah. And may I suggest to you, we in, in Britain are demonstrating that problem today. That is the issue we're facing. In 2013, net immigration in this country went up by 30% to 212,000. The Office of National Statistics says that was driven by largely people from Southern and Eastern Europe. We've had four million more people since 97, although that's the ones we've counted, and we are told that there are probably about a million illegals. Mm -hmm. Three quarters of all the new jobs created in this country uh, in that period have gone, to, uh, uh, have gone to immigrants. We cannot sustain that rate. More recently, we've had much more realistic estimates of the costs of migration. The costs of an immigrant depend very much on the age and the skills of the immigrant, whether they're a net contributor or not a net contributor. Certainly the report last week from Migration Watch is looking at something like £22 billion a year as the cost to the British economy. Something that many of the earlier reports omitted was, of course, that if you have an immigrant coming to this country taking a job, in the long term, they may well contribute to economic growth. In the short term, they mean a British job applicant who didn't get a job and then gets welfare. So one immigrant getting a job implies a welfare cost uh, for the Brit who didn't get the job. There is good evidence that GDP is driven, that the two big drivers of GDP are population and productivity. Okay? So yes, other things being equal, an increase in the population should increase GDP. But it only increases it typically about pro rata. So the, the per capita GDP, which is what actually matters for how wealthy you are, stays much the same. It doesn't uh, contribute. Now, James Brokenshire, the immigration minister, recently let the cat out of the bag yes. by saying something which we in UKIP have been saying for, for years. And what we are saying is that immigration is, if you like, a left-wing issue. It's a working-class issue. The Guardian and the, uh, uh, and the Independent would like you to believe that any co appeal for control of immigration is a right-wing rant. It is only the right-wing and the fascists and the bad guys who want to control immigration. Not at all. Go and talk on the doorstep in Rotherham, as I did during the recent by-election. The people who benefit from mass immigration are the middle classes, the comfortable middle classes in the leafy suburbs. They get cheap au pairs, they get cheap home help, they get cheap Ukrainians washing their cars for them. Uh, if they own a factory, they get cheap workers in their factory. It's great for the middle classes. The problem is for the working class who find the dole queue is lengthened by immigrants, who find the social housing queue is lengthened, who find that the, the wait in, in A&E at the hospital is longer because there are more people and we don't have enough capacity because of the schools. 
What you get is wage compression. You get a reduction in lower wages. And I see that I'm short on time, so I must just kick in an anecdote, which uh, I, I think is a wonderful illustration. A fortnight ago, I was in Northampton with a Swiss news television video type um, journalist standing behind me with a video camera. And I was accosting members of the public in the street. I stopped a young man. He turned out to be Lithuanian. And I thought, oh dear, what is a Lithuanian going to say about UKIP's immigration policy? So we asked him. But what he said was, he said, I came nine years ago and I used to get good wages, he said, but since then there have been so many more immigrants that the wages have gone down. And I thought, if I had scripted the answer for the man, I could not have done better. Uh, and as one of my colleagues said to me, the people who suffer most from the next wave of immigrants are the last wave of immigrants. Good. I'm grinding to a conclusion and looking at my red cards coming up here. Can I just remind you, the motion is clearly that we want more immigration. I say to you, we want immigration, we want controlled immigration, we want the right sort of people coming for the right sort of reasons. We want, yes, immigration, but we want fewer immigrants. I therefore uh, appeal to you to reject the motion. Thank you. I thank Roger Helmer for his speech. <coughs> to continue the debate, I call on Andrew Sylvester to second the motion. Thank you. Um, I echo uh, Roger and Tim that uh, it's been a delight to be here at the Freedom Association. I think all concerned is over a hearty round of applause, which we'll do later as I've only got five minutes. Um, the <laughs> Institute of Directors has a, has a very strong point here um, as to why that immigration is good for our economy, it's good for our society, it's good for our country. Um, Roger quoted some stats from Migration Watch. Um, I've got some stats too from UCL. Um, and as much as I, as a former King's alum, I know Simon is in the room somewhere and will know my pain, um, I will take UCL's figures over Migration Watch. Uh, they say that they, uh, immigrants from uh, recent A8 countries, eight countries that came from, it came to the European Union in 2004, are 60% less likely to be claiming benefits or to be in social housing, and that they pay 35% more in direct and indirect taxes than they take public services. And that's all the more remarkable considering we've been running a public deficit during that period, um, which rather puts those figures into perspective. And on the subject of deficit, deficit becomes debt. I don't need to tell you that in this room. It's currently at 74%, which is eye-watering of GDP. The OBR, the Quango to rule all Quangos, predicts that by 2060, if that migration was to cease, that would rise to an almost Greece-like 187% of GDP. So if you want to pay the debt back, and you want to create a sustainable budget, don't kick the people out who can help us pay it off. Um, from an employer perspective, a third of IOD members uh, report in the horrible language of recruitment consultants that they have what are called hard-to-fill vacancies. More than 80% of that is because of a lack of skills in the workforce. One in seven new businesses set up in the UK last year was founded by a migrant entrepreneur. That to me strikes me as somewhat significant in this debate because migrant entrepreneurs setting up firms do not just employ themselves, but they employ our young people, people coming out of UK universities, and they build economic growth. And, and skills, skills and people and the sparks that fly off people are the most important thing for any innovation economy. They're more important than labour regulation, they're more important than central bank interest rates, they're more important than bloody HS2. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, and I admire Nigel Farage's honesty in saying that he would accept economic growth falling slightly if it meant protecting culture, society, <coughs> and cutting immigration. But while I admire his honesty, like, I simply cannot share his casual disregard for economic growth. I can't, I can't disregard the idea of greater prosperity, of greater investment, of lower taxes for workers, more money in our pockets, wherever they're from. That, to me, is a real debate here. We live in a global world and ideas travel quickly, and this debate is not in a vacuum. When the ill-advised and equally ineffective go-home vans went round UK target seats last year, they were reported on the front pages of Newspapers in Nigeria, India, questioning, they thought the Commonwealth was, was, was friendly. They thought Britain was an ally. 
when Andrew Marr, uh, when David Cameron sits on Andrew Marr's sofa and says there's too many immigrants from Eastern Europe, people in Poland who thought we were, we were on their side question why they've sent some of their best and brightest to Britain and received nothing in return. There are some problems that come from a rising population of which immigration does contribute. There is some pressure on housing, there is some pressure in schools. But we need to stop blaming immigrants as a knee-jerk reaction to long-standing problems because politicians have not been brave enough to address issues that involve significant change. We need to build more houses, we need to liberalise the planning system, we need to build schools, we need to build hospitals. And given that 14,000 of London's 37,000 doctors are foreign-born, I have a damn good idea where we can find the doctors. We need to challenge the education unions who prioritise their own careers over their own children and create a low-skilled workforce in a high-skill economy. We need to deregulate the labour market to address the scandal of youth unemployment. We need to clamp down on employers who refuse to pay the minimum wage and gang masters because they have no place in a modern economy. And yes, we do need to clamp down on the few examples of benefit tourism. But the answer to none of these very complex problems is to hang a sign somewhere over that cliff saying, Britain's closed for repairs, come back in five years, we might have it sorted by then. Because the very people who can help us sort these problems are the very people that we are currently scaring. Thank you. <laughs>
and then much more in the 1990s. So I find myself unmoved by economic arguments and financial arguments and historical arguments, partly because the past suggests that this is a country where people tend to leave more than they arrive historically, and because there is no reason to think that the long-run prosperity of the United Kingdom demands the importation of people. Other domestic policies relating to welfare, productivity, the flexibility of the economy are far more important. Now, I think it is in theory possible uh, that the United Kingdom could design a system that would allow some level of low-scale migration to be decided by yourselves uh, and some level of high-scale migration uh, in a way that would be roughly satisfactory for a great many people. That's certainly conceivable to me. The difficulty is that as long as you're in the European Union, you cannot design that policy Absolutely. or any other policy. Absolutely. So, you know, I encourage advocates of higher immigration to keep on making exactly these sorts of arguments because what they end up doing in the minds of the British people is discrediting the European Union. <laughs> so I'd say keep it up. <laughs> Let me just close with one sort of economic reflection. Uh, most of the research that I've read on this subject suggests that if you have an unflexible economy, uh, low-skill immigration tends to be more damaging, and that makes a good deal of sense to me. Uh, if your labor markets are inflexible, if you have a lot of welfare spending, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, low-skill immigration causes more problems. I can see Britain benefiting from higher levels of low-skill immigration if it had a very limited welfare system, uh, if it was a much, if it had a much smaller state, if it was much more flexible, uh, if it was much more adaptable, and in a word, modern. I understand the logic for that. The difficulty is that in that sort of economy, you would employ more low-skilled Britons in the first place, and you would have less need for low-skilled yeah. Britons. Yeah. Thank you. I thank Ted for his speech, and now I invite questions from the floor. As I mentioned, I'm going to take them in pairs, and then I invite the sides to address the questions one at a time, selecting one speaker from each other. The right first, because that's always the best place to start. <laughs> the gentleman in the check, and then, and then I'll take the gentleman in the green jacket. Thank you very much, Philip Kenyon. Surely, in the end, this is a matter of liberty. I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said there can be no liberty without economic liberty. And as libertarians, what could be more inspiring, what could be better than to see people coming here and making themselves free by engendering their own economic liberty. And I think it's fantastic that Britain offers them the opportunity to do that, and we should absolutely applaud it and be very much in support of it. And then the gentleman in front of you. Thank you, Jonathan Bullock. Uh, I think where Tim's uh, anarcho-capitalism breaks down is if you had this free migration, what's to stop Russia sending 100,000 of its members, troops, Soviet activists over to here uh, to take part, vote in our elections and everything? And the whole idea breaks down. Uh, and so I'm going to go the other way around because they went first first time. Uh, first of all, the liberty question. Either of you want to start talking? Well, can I say the second question answers the first question very neatly. Um, I absolutely reject the argument that to be a libertarian, you must have open borders uh, for all the reasons that I've explained. You simply cannot run a welfare system. Maybe we shouldn't have such a generous welfare system. You can't run a welfare system and invite the whole world to come. We thought we, we, thought we had uh, a national health service. What we got is an international health service. So I believe in freedom. Uh, I believe in a, a level of immigration, but I do not believe that freedom is a sort of let them all come deal. And fundamentally, you're, you're questioning the existence of the nation state. Uh, because if you, if you have completely open borders, you simply can't operate uh, a nation state in the way we understand it. And I don't think you can have freedom within Britain unless you have the protection provided by the nation state. So I think that is the answer to the question. And the opposition? Well, this is the, the liberty question. Yes, please, liberty question. And Lord Turret said something fantastically interesting yesterday about Britain in 1940 um, and about what sort of country we wanted to be. Now, from here, the, you know, and then Sir Mark later in the evening talked about the flame of freedom. From here, freedom spreads. I think that 
and this is where Tim and I disagree about nation states, I think as a nation in which the Magna Carta was signed, we have a duty to talk about freedom, to talk about economic freedom. Freedom, well, borrow some of Ted's language, the pursuit of happiness does include the pursuit of economic security. So if a chap from Bolton sets up his own firm so that by the age of 55 he can retire to the south of France with the Pinot Grigio and that's his driver, that's good for the economy if he's employed 17 people from Bolton. It's also good for the economy, it's good for this concept of liberty. If somebody comes over from Poland or from wherever to set up a small plumbing business in order that they might be able to survive in this country and send their kids to a better education system, though it is flawed, to a better education system than exists at home. So, I think we have a duty. Okay, and I remind speakers at hand questions, we've got limited time, so please keep all remarks brief. We've still got one more question to answer from the floor about hostile takeovers. Uh, Ted, did you want to? Oh, no, no. No? Okay, um, I'm always delighted to be called an anarchist. That's always such fun uh, to, to, to link liberty to anarchy. Um, my point is this, I, abs I think there's actually a lot of consensus here. But my problem is that if we go down the passport socialist restrict immigration line, to, to, to quote the other side, if we use numbers, you know, like Tony Blair style central planning, those targets, the numbers, in, and I quote Roger, an agreement with the IOD, yeah, yeah, you are engaging in Tony Blair style central planning, okay? Now I have more confidence in markets and in human beings to find the right level of immigration. I also agree that this issue is, an, is primarily an issue for the English working class, okay? My problem is not with the market controlling immigration, which is what I believe in. My problem is with the welfare state. Okay? I repeat, I would get, not only get out of the EU, I would scrap the National Health Service. I would scrap the welfare state. Why? Because I want more and better health care without the state. I want more and better welfare and social security without the state. Friendly societies, mutuals, all kinds of organizations in a market. Yeah? What I don't want is a new bunch of central planners telling us in an agreement in a cosy room at number 10, you know, what numbers of people are we letting in? No. Another working class issue is this. <coughs> the left always tell us that the NHS is about equality. No, it's not. The NHS is the class system. You have mainly posh, white, male, privately educated consultants at the top, and you have often female, ethnic minorities skivvying at a paltry sum at the bottom. If you're a member of the English working class, you will get on average, and this is Labour Party data, yeah, I will, you will get on average 40% less resource per illness episode than if you're from the professional or managerial class. So I'm against the EU, and I'm against the welfare state. Yeah? It's because I'm against those things that I'm in favour of the market restricting immigration, not a bunch of politicians who want to centrally plan numbers and define what skills we need or what we don't need. That's the road to socialism and to perpetuating the welfare state. I'm reminding people generally what about what I said about two questions. And I'll just uh, take the lady in red here and then the gentleman with the arm up there. It, it occurs to me that as the NHS is so beloved that it has to feature as a main plank of the opening of the Olympic ceremony, yep. that getting rid of the uh, welfare state and the national health system is very, very unlikely any time in the future that we can foresee mm -hmm. and therefore the basic premise of your argument of unfettered immigration and uh, unfettered welfare uh, it sort of crashes before it starts. Mm -hmm. so, uh, like many people in this room and probably Roger uh, I've lived and worked abroad and in every country that I've been in 
I've had to have a work permit. Yeah. If I want to go to the United States, I can uh, work towards a green car. Yeah. If you're going to have immigration, surely, if the economic argument is there, you provide a work permit, mm -hmm. and then people who want to stay in this country and are, and are uh, contributing uh, should then apply uh, for residential status and eventually nationality, perhaps. But one thing they must have, and I throw this into the hat, is a sympathy for our sense of humour in this country. <laughs> <laughs> so invite someone from this side to write the NHS. You already have, so Andrew. Um, so the question about the unlikeliness of, of tearing apart the welfare state, I think probably right. Um, and for what it's worth, the, the idea remains neither anarcho-capitalist nor corporatist. 70% um, of our members are SMEs, so, so just that. Um, what we can do is create a welfare system that rewards work. Um, right now, if you're a single mother with two kids and you get a job earning 23k a year, uh, your marginal tax rate when you get that job is 74%. So this is this is rational economic decisions. If you're if you're only six grand better off after a year of working eight till six every day and you've got two kids and you have to pay for childcare, why are you going to work? We need to change the welfare system. I actually agree with the Milton Friedman quote about welfare states and free movement of people, but I think. The issue there is not the free movement of people, it's the welfare state. And we need to stop blaming immigrants, <laughs> not blaming immigrants, but stopping immigrants coming in, um, because we've got a political class that is scared of doing such things. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy uh, with the argument that you just made, and I, I think uh, I had the exact same thought uh, when I read a recent piece uh, by your boss uh, at the IOD, uh, who made the argument in a very compelling sort of way uh, that Britain needs to allow what he called the brightest young minds in the world uh, to immigrate into the UK for the benefit of, uh, of Britain. That sounds fantastic. Uh, and then he went on to say, until such point as the entire welfare and education system is reformed, we are also going to need a lot of, I would presume, lower skilled people to make lattes. That was where my level of sympathy sort of began to fall off a little bit. Um, it, it will be, unfortunately, a long time before the welfare system is reformed in a way yeah. uh, that many people in this room, and for a lot of people outside this room, would find satisfactory. So the net political result of that kind of argument is lots and lots of low-skilled immigration now and sort of vague promises of welfare reform <laughs> down the road. I don't think that's a sustainable system politically, or economically, or probably even fiscally. Well, we've got 15 minutes um, left. Uh, sorry, well, I was going to do the road. So the, 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 I was, sorry, I was going to do the. the You're road. actually going to answer a question. It's a rare thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I answer lots of questions usually. No, not you, I meant genuinely in this debate. Uh, yes, well, no. No, uh, uh, but, but, but I must preface that by saying I'm rarely accused of being on the road to socialism. If we have governments at all, they have to make some decisions that can only be made collectively, and I would argue that immigration is one of them. But in response to your point about work permits, you will not be surprised to hear, sir, that what you have set out is exactly the UKIP policy. We need to have work permits. We need to have an appropriate system of applying for permanent membership and people permanent residents and people demonstrating uh, that they qualify for it and have behaved in an appropriate way. That is what we think. You are absolutely right, in my view. I'm going to take I'm going to take questions three at a time now, so we can get more in. Gentleman on the, on the end here first. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, this side's argument um, is actually failed in practice when you look at individual industries. Um, for example, um, in the 50s and 60s, the cotton industry in Lancashire, the wool industry in uh, Yorkshire, imported large numbers of um, unskilled, low-skilled immigrants, and subsequently, um, because of that, failed to invest in the high-tech machinery they needed to survive. In contrast, in Japan, they didn't invest in the high-technology machinery, and we have very little um, of the uh, cotton industry left in Lancashire, whereas they have um, a very successful um, um, textile industry in Japan. Gentleman right at the back. Yeah. Um, uh, <coughs> quick, well, it's a quick question. Um, you talked a lot about how, I would first of all say you're obviously not in favor of the work class. 
that's pretty clear. But my point is about the cultural. Sorry, is that you're looking at yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. Um, <laughs> my point is about the cultural impact of this. Now, Jasmine oh, yeah. Sangera, who was born in Derby, works with women who flee honor based violence in this country. She was born in Derby and fled an arranged marriage because her family had imported not only themselves' work but their culture, and they believed that she should be forced into a marriage and promised to someone. She deals now with thousands of people a month who are playing honor-based violence and brutally honor murders in this country, especially the mass problem we also have with female genital mutilation. Now, my point is, it's completely selfish and reckless that now, 50 years down the line, because you're in favor of everyone coming here, we now have a situation where there are girls who were born in this country or are just as British as I am, just as British as most of you in this room do now, because we didn't demand that people change their culture or integrate in any way and we allow anyone to come in, that you now have a situation where the very freedoms that you're in favour of, and of course you'd be in favour of for your own children, are being completely undermined and in many cases brutally snuffed out. Good point. <laughs> It seems to me that there's a certain element of hypocrisy on both sides of this uh, argument. Um, the <laughs> proposers of this uh, motion uh, talk about uh, believing in the free market and freedom, uh, and yet they want to clamp down on employers that don't pay the minimum wage. But that's a distortion of the free market. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have uh, the, the opposition uh, saying that they want the right sort of people. They want the Indian scientist rather than the unskilled Romanian. Now, I'm not sure whether it is distinguishing between nationalities or, or between skills. But who in government is it that can determine what skills we require in the future? Because many of the greatest entrepreneurs in this country have no qualifications whatsoever. So why do, why do we differentiate in this kind of free market that we so applaud? The crunch of the matter is that a nation needs to be at ease with itself, and when you have got a quarter of a million net immigration, that uh, produces so much tension within societies that they cannot cope. And it is the politician's job to ensure that there is a transitional period to ensure that they can cope. A quarter of a million houses don't get built in one year. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, how, the uh, education classes don't get done. So that is what the politicians should be doing, working out the transitional measure so that we can have the genuine free market. Picking out whichever of those you choose to answer, proposition first. Right, um, yeah, industries come and go, get over it. It's called a market, it's called change, constant change in, is, you know, common to all business. You can't centrally plan. Um, work permits. Can't wait for the bureaucracy to be built around their administration. Yeah? Can't wait for that to be administered works in by a new agency. Yeah. And why do we have it in the US? Why? Because in the US, for example, in healthcare, since the mid-60s, yeah, they, they've increasingly followed Britain. They've got Medicare, Medicaid, S-chip for children. Now we've got Obamacare. They're, they've got a massive social security, okay? America isn't a free market country, yeah? The problem is the welfare state, not immigration. Just overlaying a new bureaucracy of work permits not only has undermined American enterprise, but it will now come to Britain if you keep getting any power and undermine ours. It's absurd, yeah? Can you imagine border force or whatever agency is going to come up? administering this system, following the meetings with the IOD where the numbers are agreed. It's, it's socialism. The most important point I think that has been made today for me is that lady there, okay? When you said it's not on the agenda to reform the welfare state or the NHS, mm. let me remind this audience of one thing. You are not UKIP. You are not the Tory party. Sitting here, you're the Freedom Association. You're the intellectual vanguard for the open society. It is not good enough for a TFA audience to say, oh well, it's not on the political agenda, we're not going to be able to change, open up our markets, get rid of the wealth, move from the welfare state to welfare without the state, so we're just going to go to this 
to default to work permits, more bureaucracy, less immigration, less global engagement, because that's what it will end up with. And SMEs and ordinary people and big business, the whole lot will suffer. No, you should vote for this motion. You should champion free markets in people, freedom, liberty, I mean, it, it is what it says on the tin of this event, yeah? And most importantly, you should focus on getting rid of the welfare state. No. That's the problem. If you don't, then God bless you, the TFA is just operating in the wake of Clement Attlee and the 1945 settlement. And to me, that is socialism. <laughs> I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely astonished by this feat of, of argumentative acrobatics that manages to, manages to equate immigration control with socialism. And I recall that countries like Australia and Canada have very sensible and well-considered immigration policies, uh, and I don't regard those as being particularly socialist. Can I come back to the gentleman over here who challenged my use of uh, the phrase that I preferred an Indian software engineer to an unskilled Romanian? The reason for contrasting uh, an, Ind an Indian with a Romanian was to stress that our policy is nothing to do with ethnic ethnicity. And my reason for selecting a software engineer versus an unskilled person was to stress that we have a policy that favors skills over lack of skills. I am well aware that there are individuals who come out of nowhere with no apparent education and do brilliant things. And there are some kids who will one day grow up to be just like Mozart. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that any kind of border control system can identify one applicant and say, we will let this person in because one day they will be as brilliant as Mozart. What we can say is, we're terribly short of software engineers, so we'll encourage software engineers, and we would rather have people with degrees than, than people with no education. And that seems to me to be simply common, rational common sense. We have five minutes remaining, so we'll take three short questions. Lady at the front, please. I didn't hear anything about um, big business in the UK. In the United States, there's a real problem with the immigration question. The, the lobby pressuring um, Congress people and uh, caring only about their narrow uh, short-term interests. What is the situation in the UK? And the gentleman on the front row here, yes, Roy, yes. Uh, Roger, you use the Milton Friedman quote, you can have open borders or you can have a welfare state, but not both. I forgot to mention his next line was, <coughs> therefore I'm in favour of illegal immigration. Isn't the reality of this that all the time we do have government planning of schools, education, transport, um, open borders immigration leads to pressure points and leads to resentment domestic people when they're behind on queues for these public services. And so actually, paradoxically, more immigration now would lead people to become more anti-immigrant and anti-competition and actually erode the sorts of values that you're looking to. Okay, and last question of the day. <coughs> yes. Right. Uh, my country was two weeks in starvation in the Second World War because we needed to import so much food. And as a fully paid up member of, the op of Population Matters, the optimum population for Britain is about 30 or 14 million. So it, it's a sort of gross numbers. It's not the superstructure, you see. You should have joined me down in London sewers to see what the real problem is. There's no shortage of skills if we're not... What an invitation, thank you so much. Um, and uh, if I wrap, rather than a wrap-up word, I'm going to invite each panellist to be briefly. And, um, first off, I'd like to disassociate uh, the ID uh, from the idea of a cult. Uh, secondly, on, uh, on, on the question about the big business, um, I, I, wish, I wish we had as much power as everyone thinks we do, um, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's not easy lobbying, um, and I, I, wish, I wish we could just come up with some numbers. Um, on the, the question about housing and, and press points, um, I do think you're right. I'll go back to my old question about political class. Um, I don't think there'll be too many people in this room um, who will disagree with the right to buy policy. Um, the problem was that governments after that didn't replace any of the housing yeah. stocks. Um, uh, we look at oligarchs, uh, house prices mentioned earlier, oligarchs buying them up to evade tax. Well, yes. So the answer then is to simplify your tax system. 
yeah. and ensure that when they buy them, so they're taxed effectively. I think, I think what we're basically getting to, and I think there's a lot of consensus here, and I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly, Alex, sorry, um, is that when we talk about immigration in this country, I don't think we're actually talking about immigration. We're talking about a state that is at once too big and is failing in too many of its key duties. Um, it, it has built, about the only thing it's built properly in the last 20 years is uh, an education infrastructure at university level, um, whose fees are only kept low by international students. Yeah. I'm talking about the working class, the fact that fees remain vaguely affordable compared to uh, cousins across the, the Atlantic uh, is because we are open uh, to international students. So. Yeah, uh, let me just take a couple of, of, these, of these questions. Uh, the question about sort of U.S. Uh, big business lobbying. Uh, I, think, I think the coalition for what is called reform of the U.S. Uh, immigration system is fairly diverse, but it certainly includes as leading members uh, large and even some medium-sized firms who see themselves as benefiting from uh, increased, either increased immigration or legalization of the existing illegal population or some combination thereof. I understand where they're coming from, from their own point of view, self-interest. Um, and you know, everyone's free to lobby for their own self-interests. But I'm, I'm not sure that I really want an immigration system uh, which is determined by the lobbying interests of big business um, against sort of you know, broader questions. I, I like the idea of a market-based system, which by the idea is basically a work permit-based system. If there's an open job, you know, yeah. which someone has a need to fill, that creates the need for a work permit. Yeah. This idea that, that work permits are created by the government, not by the market, I, I think it's sort of a delusion. Work mm -hmm. permits come from jobs that need to be yeah. filled yeah. Um, yeah. from the market. Um, on, on Ryan's question of, of <laughs> queuing, I mean, I entirely agree. Um, I, the, our, our, uh, Dr. Evans has made a lot of references to the TFA's regard for freedom, of course. Uh, but there's also the question of you know, the question of political practicality. This argument, which has come up again and again, that if we just fix the entire welfare state first, change everything, then immigration uh, will no longer pose any serious planning issues, and the queues will go away. I, I think that's a great argument in theory. But you know, Lady Thatcher was a practical politician. She believed in doing what she could, when she could, and yes, she was bold, and yes, she was in favor of freedom. Uh, I do not think she would have accepted the argument that one has to achieve nirvana in the area of the social welfare state uh, before one moves in some other area in a practical kind of way. The truth is, Lady Thatcher was a practical politician, but she was always keeping ahead of the game. And what she had in mind was to open up British industry, to global competition in the way she did, and what she hoped would follow was that we would then move beyond the welfare state. Mm. And if she had stayed in office, she would have moved on to the human services. If Lady Thatcher were here today, she would know, she would expect the TFA to keep ahead of the game. She would expect you to really keep your eye on the ball of reforming those human services, of, of going for more welfare without the state, of more private supply of so-called public goods. She would be looking to, with the level of debt we've got now, 1.4 trillion, she would be looking, for example, to privatize the motorway network, which the Treasury have valued at 100 billion. She'd be looking to pay the debt down. If she was faced with the choice of carrying on and pushing Thatcherism into the welfare state, opening up the NHS so that we moved to a proper market mm -hmm. that doesn't murder and kill mm -hmm. so many people mm -hmm. prematurely, particularly down mm -hmm. amongst the less, the less articulate and the poorer in our communities. Yeah? What she would say to you is, no, I know there are concerns about immigration, but let's not go up that alley and let the state off the hook. She would listen, and you know this is true, she would listen very carefully to entrepreneurs, be they small or large. She would listen to business. And she would want to grow our airports, to get us out of the EU, and for us to be a confident, globally engaged Britain. 
And deep in her heart, she would say to herself, in this century, are we going to have more or less airports? More air flights coming here? More Brits working abroad? <coughs> or less? She would say, do we want another level of American-style bureaucracy where you can't just get a job, but you need a permit? <laughs> Did Margaret Thatcher ever talk about a permit? <laughs> Wake up. You're the Freedom <laughs> Association. Hammer the welfare state. Hammer the EU. Go for global engagement. Please, honour Thatcher, support the motion. <laughs> Can, can I conclude on the reference to Milton Friedman, who, by the way, I had the privilege of meeting in the States shortly before he sadly died. I can tell you that Mr. Friedman had a great sense of humour. Um, now, uh, we've heard a lot from Tim over here about freedom, and we're the Freedom Association, and yes, we are, and we are committed to the idea of freedom. But I suggest to you that freedom, as we understand it, can only exist in a country where we have order and the rule of law, mm -hmm. yes. and I suggest yes. to you yes. that it is self-evident yes. that if you have totally open borders with anybody coming from any part of the world yes. without any question, you cannot maintain order and the rule of law. You cannot. Yes. Have a yes. Yes. Uh, I am very sympathetic to what Tim says uh, about the problems created by the welfare state. It was Simon Heffer who said, uh, we have an underclass because we have decided to pay for one. Um, the, whole, the, whole, the whole welfare system is a, is a major problem. And perhaps we would be having a different debate if we could entirely dispose of the existing welfare system uh, and create an idealised one. We could have this debate again when we've done that. But we haven't done that. We live in the world as it is. Absolutely. And today it is self-evident to me that we cannot support a motion calling for more immigration. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I promised you a vote. I fear I know it's where it will go uh, in any case. But we will have one. We won't take our hands. It's clapping and acclamation. So you shout I first if you believe that the proposition won, and nay second if you believe the opposition won. So first of all, all those believing that they support the proposition in this house believes more immigration say I. Aye. And all those who believe and want to vote in support of the opposition, the South does not believe we need more immigration, say nay. Nay! Can anyone change their mind? Please join me in thanking our speakers.